colors can make things stand out in your photographs, but they can also hide things away. They can complement each other or cause conflict, depending on what you choose to put in your photograph. And you can make these decisions when taking the photograph, but also when editing the photograph. You do need a good understanding of color theory to make very conscious decisions. And when you do, you can really make your photos come alive. And in this video, I will be spelling color with you because that's how it's meant to be spelt. How dare you? To get an idea of what's going on with colors, let's start with color wheels. The traditional color wheel was created by Isaac Newton. And you might remember this from school. It's the RBY color wheel, or red, blue, yellow. You have primary colors, secondary colors, and the tertiary colors. However, this is mainly for color pigments, so arts and crafts. Other color wheels do exist, and they're really important for photography. There's the CMY color wheel, which stands for cyan, yellow, and magenta. This is more from a printing perspective, as it gives a more accurate color mixing result with pigments. Then there's the RGB color wheel. And as digital photographers, this is what we use because the sensors in our cameras pick up the red, green, and blue wavelength. The RBY color wheel is a subtractive color model, whereas the RGB is an additive model. When color is painted onto a canvas, the more you blend colors, the darker they get. Whereas with a monitor, the color is created from light. So the more you add, the brighter it gets. Now color can be broken down into its constituent parts, which is saturation, value and hue. Saturation is basically how vibrant a color is. It has a few different names like intensity or chroma, but basically these mean the same thing. If it's completely desaturated, it will be gray. Whereas if it's saturated, it will be full of color. When something is a totally saturated color, you can't get any more of that color into it. The more you desaturate the color, the less vibrant it becomes. There are also values of color, and this basically tells you how bright or dark it is. This is also called luminosity or brightness, but basically they all mean the same thing. You can add shades of color by adding black. You can add tints of color by adding white, then tones by adding gray. In Photoshop, these three things, tints, tones, and shades, can be found in this square when you click on the color palette. Tints along the top, tones in the middle, and shades down the right-hand side. Or to break it down into a simpler way to understand, saturation going from desaturated on the left to saturated on the right, and then values from the top to the bottom. If you look at the second and third numbers here, they are S and B, which stand for saturation and brightness. If I take the picker and slide it top to bottom, this will change the brightness percentage. Then if I move it side to side, this will change the saturation percentage. Now there's a lot more to know about this palette, but I'm just keeping it simple because I don't want you to get bogged down with things that you don't really need to know to start with. When people talk about hue, they're basically talking about the origin of the colors that we're seeing. Think of hue as one of the six primary or secondary colors. In other words, the underlying base color of the mixture you're looking at is either yellow, orange, red, violet, blue, or green. So if what you're photographing has a red hue, it could be any shade between purple and brown, but again, that underlying color is red. And in Photoshop, with this color palette, you can see the values of hue in this slider to the right of the square. And then with this first number, H, which stands for hue, this is measured in degrees. And this goes from zero to 359 and then back to zero. This is basically the angle taken from the color wheel. For example, with this sunrise, if I'm changing the hue, I'm changing that base color. And this in turn changes all of the colors in that image. Another aspect of color theory is temperature. Now, I'm not talking about the actual temperature, but how the color makes the viewer feel. You can have warm or cool colors. And if you were to split the color wheel in half between the reds and the purples on one side and the greens on the other, this would give you the warm, cool split. Now, this can be controlled by the white balance in your camera and your editing program. I tend to shoot in raw and then edit the photograph afterwards. And this is a great thing that you can do with your landscape photography. And you can change how that photograph feels as opposed to getting it absolutely accurate as to what it was. Again, this is bringing out the artistic side of photography as opposed to just capturing what was actually there. I tend to use this in my landscape photography to represent a feeling I want to recreate with the viewer when they look at my photographs. Pushing the white balance towards the blues will give it a colder feel, whereas pushing it towards the yellows will give it a warmer feel. However, with any kind of editing, you need to be careful with how much you add or take away. 
It is easy to take it a little bit too far and end up with a garish looking photograph. One thing I do to keep the colors looking okay is to push the tint slider the opposite way to the temperature slider. So if I want to cool the shot down a bit, I'll push the temperature slider into the blues, but then with the tint slider, I'll slightly push it to the reds a little bit. Whereas if I'm warming it up a little bit, I'll push the temperature into the yellows, but then I'll push the tint slider into the greens a touch. Like I always say with editing, subtlety is the key. Color schemes, also known as harmonies, are basically different groupings of colors that will either complement or contrast each other. You can use these when editing, but if you do understand them, you can start to look for different colors that will complement or contrast each other when you're out taking those photographs. You know that feeling you get when you walk into a room and everything just seems to work? This is normally due to the designer using one of these schemes. The first scheme is monochromatic, not to be confused with grayscale. Grayscale is a form of a monochromatic scheme, but a monochromatic scheme doesn't have to be black and white. This scheme can be any one color around the color wheel, and it's a grouping of brighter or darker values of that one color. So a scene like this could be referred to as a monochromatic scene, as it just has shades of yellow in it. Let's say you're photographing a lush green forest and you want to emphasize this. You could take out all of the other colors present and just keep the greens. Now this next one is complementary colors, and it seems like a strange one because the colors come from opposite sides of the color wheel, but it does work. If you think of a sunset over a blue sea, that is blue and yellow, or in this case, you've got the red tea house surrounded by greenery. In making these videos, I've even made a conscious decision with the color of my hat and my jacket. Blue and orange are pretty much on the opposite sides of that color wheel. Split complementary colors are a more advanced version of this. It consists of three colors where two are close to each other and the other one is on the opposite side of the color wheel. This is where you can have shades of one side with a solid of another. If you were to take a picture of a woodland with a varying shade of leaves, this basically uses this principle. The analogous color scheme is basically where you have three or more colors fanning out from one color. A great example of this would be an autumn scene where you have all shades of yellows, oranges, and reds. Now it's one thing to understand this, but to put it into practice, it might seem a bit daunting. However, it's quite straightforward once you've done it a few times. The first thing is to work out what the most dominant color is in your scene. Next, is there anything in that scene that will either complement or contrast that color? Let's say you were to wait for the sun to set. Would the yellows and possibly reds of that sunset help or hinder that landscape? If there are people walking through your shot, could you wait until someone walks past in a certain colored jacket? Sometimes this can work really well because that one color will really complement the background color. When shooting landscapes, if you have a particularly red sunset and the scene is very green, green and red are on the opposite sides of the color wheel. And this follows that complementary scheme. Whereas a sunset in the autumn might follow the analogous scheme because it'll have yellows, reds, and browns, as well as the yellows and reds of the sky. It's also fun to try to isolate colors or try to find less colors in your scene. If there are too many in there, it can become really overwhelming to the viewer, causing a very chaotic color scheme. So when you can, try and find a scene that has all of the same colors in it and see how that makes you feel. Or if you can't do that, try and edit a scene so it ends up with all of the same colors in it. It's amazing how different colors can make the viewer feel different ways. Or you can take the color out completely. Now I'll be going into much more detail in the contrast video in this series, because in reality, a black and white image utilizes contrast within that scene. Now, if that video is ready, I'll link it here. And if not, I'll put the visual hierarchy video here, which is another really interesting topic to follow if you're working on your compositions. I'll see you next time.